Hi, my name is Benedict. Today's video is going to be about a kind of processing or filtering that we tend to forget about a lot of the time. And it's actually an incredibly powerful tool in our arsenal. Let me show you something. Now, I'm going to actually blank the screen so you can't see what this is. But try to have a sense of what this sound is and where it might be coming from, as in what is the, the kind or style of instrument that's generating it. Now obviously it's not a violin, but it kind of sounds like one, and I'm clearly playing it with keys. Some of you may well have thought that that's a sample. It's actually not. It's pure synthesis and it's pure analog style synthesis, as in it's not a complex uh, wave based instrument. It's not doing anything unusual at all. Let's have a look at that instrument. It's Thor. It's Thor going through some processes. So we'll work our way through turning them off. There's a little bit of reverb and a little bit of delay. We're going to leave them in because working, especially in headphones without reverb and delay is uncomfortable. Now suddenly we're starting to get a, a kind of a flat synth sound. It's nice, but it's a flat synth sound and it's lost a lot of that character that it had. So let's work our way through what this is and what it does. Our architecture is oscillator. At the moment I'm using a pulse width. Nothing wrong with using a saw. That's where I start. But a pulse width gives us a little bit more ability to, to play with the sound. It's going to filter one which has just got a very mild high pass on it. You can bypass this, but it is nice to actually remove some of the low ends, especially on strings. They're not overly dominant in the fundamental. And as we'll see later, removing partials or particularly fundamentals is, is a pretty big part of getting to where we got to. That sound is then sent to another filter which is a low pass, pretty standard 12, 24 dB low pass filter. Use whatever works for you. We're going a little cautious on the envelope shape or the envelope depth, simply because strings actually don't have a massive envelope difference. If we look at the, uh, the performance settings, we can see that uh, velocity does control the envelope depth and the envelope is also affected by our velocity somewhere. <laughs> I've been working on this for a little while. So key velocity, yes. Changes envelope attack, makes it shorter the harder we play. And it increases the filter decay the louder we play. So that gives us a little bit of range in how we play. You may also notice that there's a portamento. Nice, but just kind of a bit dead. I know the official thinking is that you're supposed to use a legato mono. So but to me, that awful always sounds horribly like a mono synth. Nothing wrong with mono synths, but when I'm doing this, I don't want to sound like a mono synth trying to sound like an instrument. I want the instrument to sound unique. So my personal preference is to go polyphonic. And then through careful use, you minimize the, the 
Well, the, the theremin feel. We've, of course, also got a little bit of vibrato. This is set so that we can leave our vibrato on and just play. So there are delays. There's a key follow. So what's happening there is that the rate of vibrato changes based on how high or low a key we press. It's easier to play a fast vibrato on a violin higher than it is lower. The, the bassier the string, the fatter the string, the slower you're going to tend to actually vibrato it. So by varying that across our keys, we actually end up with a slightly more realistic sound. Plus when we if we play several keys together, The vibrato isn't all perfect because find me a quartet where every single fiddle player is got perfect in sync vibrato. Yeah. So all of those things help give us a little bit more movement. Add a second oscillator, but you'll notice it's not detuned. While it's very tempting to do this, we move very much into synthy sound. And the problem with trying to create several instruments in one instrument, as in a little group of players in one instrument, is that immediately you're going to end with sounding very electronic. The same goes for trying to duplicate guitars, playing a guitar once and electronically duplicating it for hard pan, or singing something once and electronically multiplying it, you end up with a very electronic sound. And that's great. I love synth strings, but in this case, I wanted to come up with a sound that didn't sound like it was coming from a synthesizer as such. Now, the nature of this instrument and many instruments, synths, is that it will give you a different phase position. So each of those waveforms in a slightly different wave phase position as it plays. So the offset of those two perfectly in tune means that they create a new waveform. So as such, every note press is slightly different from the one before based on how those two phases offset each other. That's good. And then we add a bow. So. Now Reason has a very nice noise oscillator. So we'll turn that up for the moment. We're looking for the feel of what that bow sounds like as it drags across a string. So it doesn't want to be too loud at all. So we want to take that quite a way down. Otherwise it's just going to seem super intrusive. See, as, as we add it in, it goes from disconnected and synth-like to seeming more, more real. Now again, by real, I'm never looking to create a real violin. I know I'm not going to do it. I can go upstairs and borrow my daughter's little violin and play that if I want to. It's going to sound bloody horrible, but I can do that if I want to. Uh, what I'm looking to is create an instrument that feels unique. We've got the modulation envelope here, just applying a volume boost to the amount of bow. You hear how it pushes a little at the beginning of the note, because you always have to put a little bit of effort in to get that thing going.
that's basically our sound. Now what comes next is outboard processing. You can use any device that you've got and use your distortion process anywhere you want. Go carefully though, while it's tempting to do this and it will get you a really nice sound when you get the right kind of sound, is that it can make your sound a little one dimensional again. We're looking for complexity. I gotta say the hyperbolic here turned out really, really nicely. But in this case, I'm gonna go with a sign and Here how it's just picking out certain parts of the sound, it's pulling out that bow to some extent as well. That's really what we're looking for. We're looking for the ability to pull out little bits of the sound, but we're gonna keep doing that over and over. Something else actually we can do from our synth and I should do is, a, actually we'll do a comb filter first. Now, when I said the filter or the style of process that we tend to forget about, which is comb filters, we don't talk anywhere near as much about comb filters as we should. Uh, we'll talk about low pass and high pass, sometimes about band pass even, but comb filters are, are really super cool. What they're doing is literally just dragging like a rake through our frequency. Each one can be set up differently in the way they behave. helps us to define our sound. Comb filters are not the perfect way of achieving everything that I've been doing, but they're one step. And once you understand what a comb's doing, you'll see that we use variations of a comb. So we'll turn this off. Here's a variation of a comb. Can you hear its combiness? By using relatively short delay times and we're quite limited on our options in within Thor it's not the perfect delay for this but by creating short delays and a fairly high resonance can you hear the ring that rigging is actually comb filter Now, because it modulates, we can use a little bit of modulation. Too fast. We get into, um, into flanging. We don't really want it to be an obvious kind of a flange. And we just want to mix some of that in so that it changes and messes up the evenness. Because a synth is very even across its whole keyboard range, especially a digital synth. Now combining the comb and the other comb with that's coming out of the delay. We'll hear how our sound becomes far less even across the keyboard. That's a good thing because an instrument's never as even as you think it's going to be until it's been sampled. And even there, you'll notice unevenness across the instrument. And that's part of its charm. So that's the instrument. Now we'll start looking at things that we've done. We'll go back to our drive. That's taking everything that we've got and smushing it together. That little bit of, and you can use any form of drive that you like, any shape, any type, tubes, um, fuzz pedals, whatever you want, you're probably just going to want to go a little lightly on it because if you turn it right up, then you might become Malmsteen, but you will lose this sense of an instrument. It doesn't matter whether we're playing with violins or flutes, same sort of thing. Little bit of drive will push it together because real world instruments are actually full of 
distortion. That's a lot of what their charm is. Now this fella is one of my own. Let me drag it across, put it visible on the screen. I made a whole video about this and a partner uh, device once. They're in the Janus 4 pack. Uh, this is a resonating filter bank. Hear how that really brings things out. Guess what we're doing? Comb filtering. But we're doing it with some character. Rather than just being a fairly straight comb, our comb has its forks all messed up. Some, some tines are short, some are long, some are close together, some are further apart. It's messed up. It's got character, which is what a real instrument has. You've got that, that little wooden box which your strings are attached to and you fiddle across. That's actually a resonating chamber that creates all kinds of comb frequency issues, all kinds of phase boosts and cancellations. Strange device will quickly run through it does what it does. It's got three filters. We can listen to just them. Actually, we open it again and yep, we're behaving well again. So we can have Pure original sound, pure altered sound. We can go through our filters. Now they're a fixed filter bank. You can have the width of the filter, which is just basically how pointy it is, and low, mid, and high, basically. And then this, the resonator. Turn off our filter for the moment. The resonator at the moment's just resonating the pure sound. You'll see it's moving because we've got it automated. This is our main delay time. I shall turn off the automation because that's going to be confusing for you. That's pretty emphasized. We can mix that with hear how it's pulling out the scrape of that, that string. And this is how one violin sounds different from another why people get obsessed about Stradivarius or Stradivarii because there are things about that instrument which are different from other instruments. We can take our filter sound and mix. Just with that. So that's an EQ of sorts, a weird EQ, which has all kinds of weird face mess up -edness. And We can bring in our resonator. But wait, kids, there's more. You can take your resonator and apply that to the filter rather than the pure signal. Which means... Which means that our violin starts to sound like when the devil's playing it and the devil went down to Georgia. But this is adding character. Now we'll go back to what I was doing here. I've taken the keynote value and output it to a CV. Taken that CV, plugged it into my RC3 here. So what that's doing is taking, you can see,
Now, when we've got that little box that we call our fiddle, it has mostly the same resonances, but the chamber behaves differently for each string that we play. Each frequency we play, it behaves slightly differently. So it's it's got its own natural set resonances. So if we flick it with our finger, it will you'll get that thock sound, but the thock actually has a little bit of a tail to it. That's its natural resonance. But when we play different strings and fret it differently, and of course, even as we touch it with our bodies, we change the way it resonates. So that really gets us into sounding like one of those Urdus or whatever, the, the Chinese one string uh, violin thing. Because they're very influenced by the body and what's being done. But that shows us how we can really control what's going on. Now we want to back off that resonance a little bit. Let's bring up our filter. Bear in mind, I'm in headphones at the moment, so everything sounds kind of nasty, so I'm probably not making the same choices I'd make with speakers. getting really nice sound. Yes, there is an issue where you can hear it jump a little because we're playing in polyphonic, but our notes get out set, set out as monophonic. But that's just part of the character of doing it this way. You can always play. No one's going to notice that there's a little jump each time you move a note, which is our uh, delay time actually moving. We're changing the size of our resonator box. Plus, we've got that pretty highly emphasized at the moment, probably far too much for reality. You're probably going to want to back these off. Yeah, that instrument really brightens up. It suddenly starts to develop even more character because we've just home filtered the bejesus out of it. And then our last effect that we're doing, I'll turn this off and turn it back on again, make sure it doesn't have a cow, is we're doing something similar here with an EQ. using very narrow bands. Our comb filter, in actual fact, is looking something like this. So we're pulling out, effectively, certain partials. But because this isn't a mathematically perfect comb filter, it's got character. So if we want to play this as a cello, obviously how you choose this depends whether we're wanting a cello, a bass, a viola, a violin, or a What's nice is to actually vary. Some frequencies go up, some go down, because this is what's happening inside that chamber with our comb filters and our flanges, everything that's happening naturally inside here. And we get quite an exotic sounding instrument where we have this tendency to try to make everything perfect and flat. It is the dumbest rule you could ever have. 
I watch uh, YouTube videos. Sometimes I don't watch them. I, I turn them off. But you open up a YouTube video and some guy's going, this is the way you EQ. And he's got this curve that looks like this, trying to make everything flat and perfect. Oh, God. The mix is going to be horrible. Really horrible. Because it's going to be flat and perfect and yuck. And it's not going to last. Somebody might go, yeah, blam and mix, when they listen to five seconds of it. But we're not going to end up with uh, like a Steve Miller big old jet airplane or a bat out of hell or any kind of record that's actually going to have character. What we're looking for here is character sounds. Now that's got real character. To me, I'm sort of thinking, yeah, probably guy in Morocco. Where you put these doesn't matter. Obviously, listen to the performance that you've got. Or the, till you find an instrument that you go, yeah, that that that's doing it for me. But if you're mixing, then listen to the instrument that you've got, and you want to give it more character. Then you can do things like this. But you don't do this to get rid of bad frequencies. You do it to create tremendous character. So if we get rid of nice instrument, but not really going to cut the mix because it's very same. Hear how straight away it's given that instrument more character. It doesn't sound that much different, but it's suddenly got that little bit more cut. So dramatic and interesting EQs. A little bit of drive and a succession of things that are essentially comb filtering. So they're providing comb filtery type things which give us the equivalent of uh, flanges and I've shown you before how a careful application of a flanger can really bring us into life. Phasers, similar thing. Small amounts of phase, phaser, phase cancellation can give us tremendous character. Now notice the big difference. If we take everything off We're still getting lots of fundamental. While that sounds nice, it's not going to cut a mix particularly well. But it's going to be, I don't know how this is going to come out on here. It may be hard to show or hard to prove as such, but. It's a pretty straight looking waveform. We can see that our fundamental is... Oh. Sometimes down, sometimes not. That's the advantage of using a pair of oscillators against each other. See how always different? So let's turn back in our delay. Yeah, it's changing our waveform slightly. We'll pat back in our comb. Wow, look at the big difference that has there. Huge difference. But see how it's... Different from note to note. And then let's look at our um,
doesn't do a lot, but it does bring out these little overtones. So that's part of this, the brightness, the scratching. It's all going to depend on what kind of drive you're using or wave shaping. Again, fairly dramatic. There's tiny moves. It's not like you can see massive moves on the scopes here. our relationship here. So we've made this more complex up here, which, uh, and overall, it's no longer that sort of perfect sawtooth wave that we're also used to seeing here. And that means that it no longer sounds like a synth synth. Yes, anybody who knows violins well enough is going to go, that's not quite real. But they're not going to care because they're going to, wow, what an interesting sound. If it's well played, got a good melody and a good feel. They're not going to care because they're going to go, that's, that's cool stuff. And that's what you're looking for. So we're moving away from the idea of this having to sound like just another synth sound, playing sawtooths to sound like strings but to have real character. And that's all through having some courage to actually really mess up the sound. And again, if you're mixing and if you're presented that core basic violin sound, You're going, yeah, it's nice and solo, but I'm just not getting that through the mix. It's just not got character in the mix. It's like bleh, a dead duck. And then look at doing things like very short delays to give yourself a kind of comb filter, a straight comb filter to give yourself, I don't know, a comb filter. Yeah, hands now suddenly got this bite. A little bit of distortion or wave shaping, only a little bit, although you can go quite hard on a string so long as it is monophonic. If it's starting to do chords, you have to go very carefully because it'll just distort like a bad guitar. Now through a mix, that's going to sit so clearly where it needs to go because it's, in many ways, thinned out, its partials are all thinned out. So up against other instruments, you're going to find that sits really nicely. Now, if you've got a mix full of instruments which are all made from, let's say, Thor, so they're all essentially exactly the same platform sound, then go through all of them and be bold, turn them all into something interesting to have this real character. And then suddenly you're going to find that your mix is much easier to make. You may have stray frequencies that pop up and zing here and there. And that's where you can either look at a filter to, or an EQ just to control those little bits a bit, a little bit, uh, a dynamic EQ. Um, or plain and simple, a little bit of compression will probably do the job, which is what a dynamic EQ is. But you're not going to need anywhere near as much of anything because that's going to poke straight through a mix far easier than just another synth sound or just another perfect sound. If you have any questions or you want to hire me to either train, like to help you understand, to learn things for yourself um, or to do a mix for you, ask me. You have a good day now.